Ethnography Forum. I'm just going to say a couple very brief things. One is, um, this event I think means a lot. Thank you for being here. We're just hoping there's not a fire. Um, um, but this event means a lot. Historically, we would have the keynote speaker give their keynote speech in the morning, as Vivian Vasquez did. And then they would kind of have a brown bag panel. But one of the things in conversations that Susan and I and others have had was we realized some of the best um, practitioner research work occurs really in the company of others, in communities of inquiry, with people from different um, experiences and identities and backgrounds. So we decided to make the brown bag lunch really a time to showcase the collaborative nature of this work. So, um, and so I really want to, you know, this is a perfect example of it. Rob Simon and the Teaching to Learn Project is composed of, of, of faculty and graduate students and teachers and high school students. And they all come to share their collaborative inquiry with you today. And I'm going to really let them do more to introduce it. There's one final thing I want to say is, um, Susan Lytle and Vivian Vasquez are the respondents, but they wanted me to tell you all that this is not going to be a conventional response. It's going to be a participatory one. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> so thank you all for being here today. We're actually not going to introduce this. We're going to perform this. And we will have time for us to have conversation afterwards. Are you able to see? Oh, okay. So why don't we move this way? Yeah. Or Jason, can you move over? Can you move over? Sure. Okay. Make sure that our, our respondents can have something to respond to. Romanian Holocaust survivor and poet Paul Ceylon experienced the loss of his parents in the Nazi death camps. Through poems like Speak You Also, he paradoxically represented horrors that resisted and continued to resist representation. For Ceylon, surviving, speaking as the last, meant writing into and through Poria, confronting his own burning need to write and the insufficiency of what he called the swell of wandering words, to convey the indescribable suffering he and others experienced. Ceylon despaired that his words were not enough. In the poem Oreo Ash, he wrote, no one will bear witness for the witness. In response to this moral imperative, Jews born after the Holocaust are raised with the phrases never forget and never again. These concepts frame our study of the historical record and are woven into the fabric of stories of loved ones and others who survived or died. The first compels us to remember the atrocities of the past, and the second to ensure that history is not repeated. Like Ceylon and Elie Wiesel, who documented his experiences in the concentration camps in the book Night, my grandmother's parents died in Auschwitz. My grandmother shared stories of her family's oppression and her own escape with my family and with audiences in schools and synagogues. Among them was a story of an event that precipitated her parents' deportation to the camps. My great-grandfather ran a clothing store. In 1937, he was accused of inappropriately waving to a Christian woman who had been a customer of his for years and was jailed. My grandmother was sent to bring her father a shaving kit. As she left the Offenburg jail, she looked up to see her father crying at the bars of the third floor window. It was the first time she saw her father cry, and one of the last times she saw him alive. As a child, hearing this story and retelling it now, as a parent myself, the image of my grandmother at 16, watching her father at the window of his cell, captures a sense of profound helplessness and the consequences of indifference to human suffering. What is our responsibility as audiences to stories like this? In a speech at the opening of Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the Holocaust Memorial, Elie Wiesel spoke about the character of the messenger in Kafka's stories, who is unable to deliver his message. We feel sorry for the poor messenger, he said, but there is something more tragic. When the messenger has delivered the message and nothing has changed, our role, Wiesel, reminds us is not merely to listen to the messages of survivors, 
but to become the messengers ourselves. After Knight was inspired by this call to be messengers to the messengers, we used art to carry the message of the text forward, a message shaped by 30 educators and adolescents' critical and aesthetic readings, their own personal histories, including in many cases, family legacies of forced migration, war, or trauma. Youth and teachers use their feelings of outrage and solidarity with Jews and other victims of intolerance, combined with a sense of what Cornell West has called audacious hope, to communicate a collective vision of change. Looking back on the After Night project, I think there were many times when my mentality was changed as a direct result of my participation. The most prominent mo moment would be my interpretation of the people sentenced to the concentration camps. Before reading Night, I connected the Holocaust to a bunch of statistics, never meant to have any purpose more than pure numerical data. The novel changed that, this feeling. Bizel made it clear that there was more to this genocide than just facts. He made it possible for me to make the human connection necessary for the generation of emotions. The next part of the novel that influenced me greatly was the faith aspect. I'm a Roman Catholic who read a book based on the faith struggle of a Jewish boy. I didn't expect that feature of the book would be one of the most relatable. The challenges that Wiesel faced made him ask questions that I could see myself asking or that I have asked. It made me feel included in something larger than myself. As both faiths are monotheistic, I knew the feeling of asking God questions in times of weak faith. The experience I had doing this project was astounding. I've not only learned details about a part of history, I've also learned what happens when the mind and body of a human are put to extremes, and that the savage animal nature we often forget lies beneath our civilized surface. We see this most often in the book in accounts of sons turning on their fathers so that they themselves could survive. Mr. Wiesel himself admits to feeling at times as if his father were a burden. Knowing this, I look closer at the relationships I have in my life and wonder, what would I do with those people in that situation? Would I be able to hold on to morality? Would they? After Night has also, also made me view religion in a different light. At such a young age, Ellie loved his religion and wanted to be as divulged into mysticism as he could be. But we see him questioning God and religion more and more as his time in the camps goes on, and his struggles get worse. As a Christian, it spoke to me because the roots of my religion are found in Judaism, and many of the rules regarding being devout are similar. Reading night caused me to ask, how would one keep their faith under such excruciating circumstances? How strong would my faith be? But I also wonder, did some of those who made it out of the camps become religious? In the face of certain death, did they begin to bargain or pray? I could not begin to try and comprehend the toll of the things that so many unfortunate men and women had to go through, and the impact it's had on their lives, let alone their faith. Our collaborative response tonight involved, first, taking a t written text thanks, laden with meaning and cutting it up to make something new. This ghastly act of destigmatizing the sacred nature of a book and allowing it to become malleable active and responsive, allowed us to engage in a deeper reflection about what a piece of writing meant to us. The powerful questions Wiesel poses about the legacy of words and our dismantling and recreating of his allowed us to think about the power of language and memory and community and conversation. The project demonstrated the power of response and the insight and engagement that can come with allowing students to respond to their reading and their feelings and thoughts in a creative way beyond the realm of writing. As I observed everyone sitting and painting on pages of a memoir, I could not have imagined a better way of personally responding to Wiesel's journey 
and revalidating his experience as one to be remembered and acted on. The memoir and the project left me with great sadness, but also with so much hope. This hope was affirmed when Wiesel responded to a letter the youth involved in the project wrote. He emphasized at the end of his letter that we can make a difference in this world, and we can enact change. We just need to keep reading and learning. What a better way to enact change than providing individuals with the opportunity to read such a masterful piece. As a teacher, the After Night Project inspired me to integrate Wiesel's memoir into my curriculum in Toronto with my grade 10 students. This year, 120 students read Night and are grappling with issues of injustice in our world, trying to move beyond the hate and the sadness in this testimony to enact change and bring the hope that Wiesel emphasizes in his letter. There have been struggles teaching this memoir. Some students are exhibiting some shock that this could have happened, while others are finding it so difficult to read sections that are absorbed with violent act after violent act. Some are very open in responding to the text, while others do not want to speak about it. It has captivated my class in different ways. What more could a teacher want than to invite students to engage with a text that challenges them? As I keep teaching, there's so much I'd like to change if I had the opportunity to read, to teach night again. But the one thing that I would not change is what I started with and what came out of the night after night project. It is okay to respond in whatever way you feel comfortable. But what is most important is to act. As all those individuals were painting, we were protesting the silence and giving a voice to all those victims by not forgetting the Holocaust. If my students remember anything, I hope that is the responsibility to not forget and to keep remembering and acting because they can change things, even in small ways. A book like Night makes me want to do something more upon reading the last page besides crying. There is a gentle demand that you reflect, discuss, and for me, create. As an artist, I never know when the inspiration will come or what will be the catalyst. Always it stems from some source that has touched my emotions. My instinct after night was to write, initially. A meandering collection of thoughts, some questions about meaning and trying to find it. That is how I reflect best. But then I am an English teacher who has chosen a career path that involves endless reading and discussing and writing. Not all my students, however, will fit this mold. And it is important that students with different styles of expression, also have an outlet to reflect, discuss, and create in ways that are meaningful. There is a beautiful concept in Judaism called tikkun olam, which literally means repairing or healing the world. It is a belief that the world is fundamentally broken, and it is humanity's shared responsibility to rebuild and transform it. For me, our project was an ethical mitzvah, an act of kindness or good deed in our working towards this end. We created a tangible memory to share with our community, and in doing so, we patched together one piece of the world. This community connection is part of an essential inquiry schools should be posing to students. How can we make our communities better? My students are given the responsibility to make the world a better place. I support them to create useful evidence of their learning. I encourage them to explore their own connections to art and text and life and I encourage them to find ways to articulate their responses and expressions in ways that are personally meaningful to them. Looking at history helps us as a society to ensure our wrongdoings are not repeated. Moreover, it allows us to critically view our successes, such as ages of reason and enlightenment, and pave a path for our future. Writing a letter, making triangles, and even reading night were all small ways of exploring the path to learn for the future. By raising questions like, what makes a good government? How should people conduct themselves in war? What is ethical? But most importantly, how can we educate future generations about these scars in the face of human history? As the survivors of this event grow older and become fewer in number, this question becomes more relevant. It is the job of those who are left after they are gone to answer it. 
inviting my students to get inside a text, literally and figuratively. Through the arts, help them to materialize their readings, develop empathy, and act on it. There's a crucial link between the arts and moral action, what Susan Stinson describes as the capacity of the arts to awaken people to the possibility that the world can be different than it is. This sense of hopefulness and possibility is an indispensable component of critical literacy. Whether through poetry, painting, or performance, the arts are essential to this process. As Marjorie Siegel notes, students need more than words to learn. Wiesel acknowledges that appropriate responses should not be the main objective in reading his book. What is important for teachers and students to take away is the fact that there is a reason why we read Holocaust memoirs. That is, to never forget what happened to the Jews in Nazi Germany and to actively protect humanity from such tragedies happening again. It is everyone's responsibility to bear witness to such a black mark on our human history. Dear Mr. Vizel, in 1986, when Saddam Hussein launched his Western-backed missile attack on Tehran, I was 13. Saddam usually dropped his European-made missiles on us, infidel Persians, after midnight when I was in bed. When I woke up to the missile alert, I would stick my head into the mattress, shivering and sweating. As soon as the missiles hit, I felt sure I was alive. I thanked God, in tears, for saving my life. I immediately, however, hated myself for thanking God for having someone else killed instead of me. Some people had to perish that night, and I found it pathetic to imagine that God, for some reason, had chosen me to survive. I hated myself because I knew I was quietly celebrating someone else's death, and I hated the universe for having put me in that senseless, inhumane position, at the same time expecting me to make sound ethical judgments. The war ended. The West decided Saddam was a brutal dictator, and I started to stop talking to God forever. Human madness, however, has not ceased to exist. The meaningless lunacy that you, more dramatically than many other people, had to struggle with as a young man. The Holocaust is one of the most painful examples of how irrationally and consequently cruelly human beings could behave. When I read Night, my childhood missile nightmares assailed me again. Following your words in my bed, as well as feeling sad. I was again furious at the barbaric circumstances which had trapped you and your family. It was uncomfortable to read about the metamorphosis of your relationship with people around you in an attempt to remain human and a beastly inferno. I have a seven-year-old son. All through the book, the only face that I was able to imagine for your character was my son's face. And I think I do not need to explain how helpless I felt as a father merely by imagining my son in that situation. I have learned from bitter experience that I, as an individual of average status, can hardly control or impact explosions of human collective madness. I, however, think that I unconsciously decided to become a teacher in order to be ahead of the instant and in arbitrary policy making of history's assemblies of fools. When madness hits, there's not much time for dialogue and conversation. The boorish takes center stage and the sane are isolated. Teaching has given me the chance to speak with students before tragedy strike, before they have to make decisions that will impact other people's lives. I believe that experiences of people like you can be a very important part of this conversation, and that stories can bring students of different backgrounds together. Your message can help posterity live in a better world, and as a teacher, I feel I should do my best to help my students' logic and imagination create a world of love and harmony by learning from people like you, a world whose children feel safer than you and I did. Thank you for writing night. Best regards, Amir. As a teacher, I collaborated with art educator and activist Tim Rollins and high school students on an exhibit for the Jewish Museum in San Francisco, exploring the concept of tzedakah, the Hebrew term for justice. 
Rowan's work with youth in the Bronx, who he refers to as kids of survival, involves painting on book pages. The artwork they produce is incredible, large-scale paintings on pages of text, such as oversized gold and red letter A's on pages from the Scarlet Letter, or caricatures of world leaders on, as animals on the pages of Animal Farm. I use this approach as a teacher of adolescents who'd experienced significant school failure and violence in their lives. In his many years supporting teachers to use the arts in school and teacher education, Jerry Harsty has explored how the arts open up spaces for what he terms abduction, moving past the logical conclusion of facts, data, and information. As Harsty puts it, arts-based inquiry invites intuition, the exploration of possibility, creativity, and imagination. This idea inspired our use of the arts as a vehicle for critical inquiry in the Afghanite project. The symbolic and representational power of painting allowed us to address central themes in Bizzell's text in ways that would not have been possible otherwise. For example, we reimagined the symbol of a triangle which Nazis used to designate individuals as undesirable in ghettos and concentration camps as a representation of our connections with diverse communities and our solidarity with victims of injustice, much as activists in the gay rights movement reclaimed the pink triangle as a form of protest and a symbol of pride. Students and teachers painted hundreds of triangles on individual pages at night. The range of choices they made in color and design were incredible. Maxine Green has argued that the arts provide a sense of agency, even of power, that can open doors and move persons to transform. In the words of one student who visited the After Night exhibit, the artwork brings life and brightens, teaching a lesson to those who take the time to view it about what the power of many can accomplish. Contemporary, pardon, excuse me. Contemporary Chinese artist Ai Weiwei claims that art is a tool to set up new questions. Taken at face value, this might be fairly unremarkable or even obvious. But for Ai Weiwei, who is labeled by his country's government as a dissident, and by others as the most powerful figure in contemporary art, likely saved from censorship only by his fame, this claim represents the radical approach that his artwork takes to set up those new questions. Ai Weiwei's most famous work is also the most controversial example of how he uses these tools. Dropping a Han Dynasty urn depicts Ai Weiwei in a photographic triptych, dropping a 2,000-year-old urn where it shatters at his feet. For some, willful dismantling of art ostensibly to make new other art might seem little more than wanton and even sensationalized destruction. At its most basic, the potsherd of Ai Weiwei's photograph might invoke, if not anger or disgust, questions like, is it art? as well as perhaps why. The largest pieces of the After Night exhibition were five foot by five foot canvases, covered in gesso, and finally, pages torn, or less sensationally, meticulously cut from Mazel's night. The exhibition also featured smaller pieces that were inescapably also cut, copy after copy of night. Like Ai Weiwei, the art presented in the After Night, pro after night exhibition might controversially represent a similar kind of destruction of another venerable artifact, the book. A specific genre of book, a Holocaust memoir, likely one of the few modern sacred texts we have, adds sacrilege to our list of mysteries. After Night was my first experience using art as a means to respond to literature. As an individual who has barely picked up a paintbrush, it was a bit overwhelming at first. I wondered how everyone else felt as they were painting. Some seemed serene and others uncomfortable. Some shared their experience of reading night and others kept silent. However, as I observed everyone sitting and painting on pages of the memoir, I could not have imagined a better way of personally responding to Wiesel's journey and revalidating his experience as one to be remembered and acted on. Night, which I came to read for a second time for this project, produces in me both sorrow and a desire to live. Painting, while I enjoy it, has never produced in me these emotions. Painting has always been zen-like, a retreat into nothingness. 
but during this project, the first time I came into the classroom to paint, I was moved by so many emotions. I listened to the students as they tried to make sense of a senseless point in history. I listened to them identify with Giselle's experience and was struck by my own confusion. Reflecting on this project, I discovered that art is a powerful way to respond to text. Through the communal act of painting triangles on the pages of the memoir, we were able to represent the emotions of night in an attempt to reclaim the helplessness and regret we felt while reading Rizal's experiences as a Holocaust survivor. In the After Night Project, artistic expression was a catalyst for teaching students that when it comes to reading books which detail human tragedy, Sometimes it is acceptable and even natural to be without an appropriate academic response. Painting the many triangles we completed as a group has taught me that written and oral responses are not the only way to critically respond to a text. The medium of painting, an art form which cannot be contained, easily defined, or interpreted, can say more than words. Sometimes words are not enough. Kaddish, Hebrew, holy. A Jewish liturgical prayer, a prayer recited by mourners. We covered the words of one survivor of the Holocaust with ashes. We wrote Kaddish over the words. We covered over the words which, at the time, was to represent the sorrow of loss, to mourn those who did not have the chance to write down their own words. How strange that we would rip up a book and cover its words to honor the dead in its pages. Strange that the word we chose was not even in the same language as the text. But when I saw it hanging with the other canvases, even though I was part of its creation, I was moved. Yes, Kaddish, in so many ways, the word to represent night. A text recited by a mourner, a text for the dead, and a text which is holy. Kaddish, the Hebrew word for holy, emblazoned on night. We talked about the feasibility of writing with remnants of burnt carbon, and we couldn't decide, could we write something legible with a liquefied mixture of ash and water? In theory, the idea seemed perfect. The next day, Rob brought in a container of ash, and a few loose shards of charcoal. They came from his fireplace. We set about mixing ash and water on an improvised palette. The grainy solution was inconsistent. Some portions congealed into thick globs, while others spread across the canvas in watery grime. We were a little dissatisfied until we turned to the charcoal, and the Hebrew word Kaddish began to emerge from the pages of night. We painted on strips of paper to represent our faith. I did two pages. First, I painted blues, yellows, and greens. My faith is my life, my light, and light blue, green, and yellow all around me. Then I painted very light strips, barely there strips, as I tried to represent how unperceivable and inexplicable faith can be. I was moved spiritually through text and paint just as I was moved spiritually through reading night. As a Christian, I was also moved by experiencing faith with my classmates, who I know to be of many different faith backgrounds, Muslim, agnostic, Buddhist, atheist, Jewish, Hindu, among others. I was blessed to react collectively and collaboratively to a text I find so personal. I gained so much from taking part in this project, growing intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally. I especially feel that I was able to connect with the novel on another level through the painting components of After Night. By continuously painting new colors that reflected the novel, it became that I no longer thought of what I was putting on the paper. I just put down what I felt. In my opinion, this is a very important step when reading books. It is not only necessary to understand and analyze the book, but also to enjoy it, and to enjoy the emotions that come with it. While I gazed at Jacob's ladder that evening, 
I recalled another work that Rob and I had read together in the summer of 2011, Slavo Zizek's work on violence. Zizek draws upon Walter Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history. Benjamin, one of the 20th century's greatest philosophers, chose to take his own life rather than to hand it over to his captors during the Holocaust. In one of his last passages, Benjamin describes a troubling vision that is inspired by Paul Klee's painting entitled Angelus Novus, which now hangs in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. A Klee painting named Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past, where we perceive a chain of events. He sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage. And hurls it in front of his feet. <coughs> the angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. This storm irresistibly propels him into the future, to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress." End quote. The ethical sublimity of this painting can be located in Benjamin's evocation of the tension between the violence of history and the perpetual yet powerless witness of the angel. The politics surrounding the figure of the witness emerge as haunting tropes in Benjamin's depiction of history Bizel's testimony through night, and Ceylon's prismatic poetry. Ceylon's quote, which we also discussed in Rob's graduate seminar, no one will bear witness for the witness, is a consonant challenge. I believe the After Night exhibit attempts to address this challenge while thinking through the operatic nature of the witness. I was curious to see the final product. I forget what the purpose of bringing the Jacob's Ladder text into the class was, but I remember feeling free at that moment to represent the most deeply personal aspect of myself in front of a whole group of people. And I remember seeing the ladders in the art exhibit, the faith portion of the show, and thinking about how completely these different canvases represented my, our, experience of the text. The ladders were just one part of the whole, and producing them allowed me to represent one part of my night experience, piecing them together with other experiences of mourning, of outrage, of sorrow, of solidarity, satisfyingly and cathartically represents the complexity of our reaction to the text. Art is often configured as antithetical to literacy. The former is conceived as an imaginative practice, while the latter is often reduced to a didactic process of decoding. In our graduate seminars, we talked about how literacy practices can be framed within the figured worlds of institutions. Some of our questions then evolved. How do we reconfigure the worlds of literacy, especially the ones that we see as delimiting for our students? Defined and delimited possibilities surface during the initial stages of thinking through the After Night Project. While we were looking for a potential venue to host the exhibit, we were given very few options to exhibit the art at OEZ, the very institution that brought us together. The idea for the project did not seem to register as either literacy or art that could be posted at a suitable venue at OEZ. This art exhibition was done by teachers, graduate students, and high school students from a parachute group, all working in consort to tear, position, gesso, paint, and eventually hang our work publicly in one of the most well-trodden paths at the University of Toronto, the Hart House Student Center. On the University of Toronto campus, Hart House is another kind of venerable artifact in and of itself. One of the first dedicated student centers in North America at nearly 100 years old, Hart House first opened in 1919, and it was constructed throughout the First World War. The adjoining Soldier's Tower perhaps best represents that this building was constructed during a time of immense crisis, which it marks with the names of students and alumni of the University of Toronto who died in the First World War and subsequent conflicts that are inscribed on its walls. 
Hart House itself is emblazoned with artifacts of war as well. On the walls of the Great Hall, the site of many important presentations and galleries over its history, are crests from the universities in the British Commonwealth and other allied countries from the First World War, including the University of Pennsylvania. The Hart House Chapel holds the least obvious of these wartime artifacts, however, four pairs of mullioned stained glass windows. At first glance, these seem discordant, depicting no single scene, story, or pictorial representation of anything. That is because these, these stained glass windows were made from shards taken from the husks of destroyed churches in Europe by soldiers from the University of Toronto and brought back to the university following the war. Art exhibitions often take place in disinterested galleries, with works hung on plain walls meant to elucidate these temporary residents. Our exhibition was hung in the main corridor of Hart House, precariously perched on nylon cables stretching from the ceiling. This also positioned our exhibition as something interested in its surroundings, made different by being placed as it was, not in a sterilized gallery, but in the heart of a university campus. In this way, Hart House was not the first choice for an art exhibition, but it was the best choice. Positioning, books with fra positioning fragments of books with fragments of stained glass allows for different kinds of questions to be asked about both. Their relation to their very different testimonies of conflict, their relation to the building in which they are in, and broadly how and where art is encountered in our lives. Classrooms, for example, present spaces where art is often constrained to certain discrete lessons, if it is present at all, and where books are predictably read and returned, save for the next day's lesson or next year's students. On the other hand, artistic responses to a book, where students are invited to interact with books as physical, cultural objects, in different, potentially counter-discursive ways, might invoke intrinsically different questions and meanings than reading a book and writing about it. This positions art in and in conversation with classrooms to ask new questions of the spaces and the stories that we encounter. What kinds of stories can be told and retold from fragments of pottery, glass, and paper? Who has license or obligation to tell these stories, and who has a right to listen? How can we encounter cultural, historical, or social artifacts in our own time? under duress of expectation, policy, or curriculum? And in what ways might these questions intersect or interrupt the predictable discourses of our lives? Working on the After Night project over the course of the past two years has definitely been a worthwhile experience. Apart from learning more about the Holocaust and World War II, I was also able to share and communicate my thoughts on such a significant historical event with others. Although there have been many activities done in preparation for this project, the one I enjoyed the most would have to be the letter that we wrote to Wiesel. When studying World War II, or any historical event, we always look at the hard facts and at things that happened in the past. Being able to analyze Mr. Wiesel's account of the Holocaust helped to go past the, ba the basic facts that we learn in class. This letter allowed us to focus on the present. With Mr. Wiesel having an actual memory of the war, it becomes not so much a story, but something real, something that, for me, is almost impossible to picture. As opposed to learning the impacts and effects on the entire population, we learned how one single person was impacted and affected. To know exactly how one life was shattered and destroyed helped to paint a picture of the extent of the damage. Intens intensifying any emotions that might surface when remembering the Second World War. Art is normally considered to be one of the best ways to express <coughs> your feelings and thoughts, and in this case, it rang true. By choosing colors that, rep that represented themes in the novel, it was easier to connect with the emotions that were portrayed by Giselle in his work. After completing this project, I came to the realization that I would never truly be able to recognize exactly what happened in the Second World War because I was not there to experience it firsthand. The pain, the suffering, and the fear are all emotions that I will never, as a result of the war, feel. Even though I was unable to achieve the unachievable, I did grow a deeper understanding of the nature of man, 
what drives us and gives us courage, and what weakens us. Participating in the After Night Project was a memorable experience, heightened by the different communities that were present in the room. Graduate students, teacher candidates, and high school students all painted alongside our professor Rob, letting our paintbrushes and color choices do the talking for us. I recall trying to select bright pastel colors, colors I associate with happiness, as a means of fighting against the horrors inflicted on the Jewish people by the Nazis. In a similar vein to using the upright triangle, I wanted to reclaim the colorful and bright triangle to oppose the evil dark hues which I align with Nazi Germany through my color choices. I sat down to paint with a couple of the students. We were painting triangles tasked with finding a color which represented our reaction to the text. My color was yellow, the most difficult color for the eye to perceive. We all painted our triangles with care. As the students processed through paint, both of the boys who sat with me made variations of brown. Brown was not their intent. Instead, they felt a mixture of feelings, so they painted with a mixture of colors. Brown, muddled, muddy, messy, earthy, dirty. How do we pull apart everything we feel when we listen to a story of death and fate and outrage and sorrow? Well, these students didn't. While I painted yellow triangle after yellow triangle, these boys painted brown after brown after brown. Eventually, I painted an orange triangle, settling on my feeling of outrage, bold, unquenchable. I was outraged at the inability to express in words how I felt reading night, outraged that such a degree of evil was able to exist, and outraged that I had some pleasure in reading the memory of it. The words are so beautiful, the empathy so immediate, as we painted, the boys became frustrated with their unintentional browns. They started to separate the colors after that. Red for anger, green for life, purple for mourning. But I remained outraged. Collaborative art, like collaborative writing, has always been framed like an oxymoron to me. As someone with a humanities background, Art and writing are often represented in undergraduate degrees as solitary, enchanted projects carried out by nearly mystical people, usually men, uh, and delivered to the world without much trace of the process. <clears throat> this is certainly a naive view of literature and art, but it captures the emphasis of a degree in English literature and unfortunately mirrors my own experiences with, with my degree in the signed writing, with those single authored papers that inevitably show up in every single university course. Doctoral work in particular has been the most notable casualty of this view, that cast writing is solitary. I can't recall the number of times that I have heard a PhD being compared to a monkish lifestyle, <laughs> where a student sits in a cramped library cubicle, ostensibly reading and writing for five years. <clears throat> the After Night Project was a way out from this reductive and predictable rhythm of art and writing. And, in a, and a way in to a more nuanced and more fruitful experience as a doctoral student. After that, not only challenged notions of solitary work, it lived out those challenges and bore them out on an almost daily basis. <clears throat> I've said before to other audiences that I never thought as a doctoral student I would have spent any of my time painting with youth or teachers or contacting galleries for an exhibition. In truth, perhaps I, I bought into some of the received wisdom about doctoral work, if only because I had no recourse or an example of an alternative view. I've never seen the students in my youth group as students. I've always seen them as fellow members of my faith community, members that have a unique bond, but also a unique identity that is shared amongst the community. Working with these youth in the Afternight Project has changed the way I view myself as a teacher and how I interact with my students. In their letter to Wiesel, the youth asked what Wiesel's relationship with God was like after his experience during the Holocaust. How could one have a relationship with God after all this? What kind of a God would allow this to happen? 
In his response, Wiesel remarked that his faith is a wounded faith. The statement is something that the youth reacted to and discussed as we shared a reading of the letter together and debriefed our reactions. We shared parts of our identity and explored personal beliefs, furthering our bond as a community. When I step into my classroom, I strive to create a community like this. After this experience, I have found that it is now impossible to separate my identity as a person of faith, as a woman, as a sister, as a daughter, as a friend, as a leader, and as a teacher. They all make up who I am, and I bring this into my teaching in the hopes that my students also feel safe to explore their own identities, to explore who we are as we read, through the experiences of others in the text we share. As an educator, after night has raised questions for me. Among them, how can the arts address ineffable events like the Holocaust? In what ways might the process of cutting and painting on pages from night have memorialized or trivialized trauma? What insights has this project evoked and continued to evoke for participating teachers and youth or for viewers? And what ultimately are the impacts? These and other questions suggest that the process of responding to texts like Night are always unfinished. In the spirit of Elie Wiesel, who wrote of his personal obligation to bear witness to the horrors of the Holocaust and the limitations of language to do so, probably should be. We hear you. We want to be part of this testimony, this effort to remember and ensure that no one forgets. Through us, we sustain Jewish religion, Jewish culture, Jewish tradition, and Jewish memory, but also all religion, all culture, all tradition, and all memory. However ugly, it is our obligation to reveal evil whenever we see it and force a conversation about it. Evil does not go away when we bury it. When language burdens our memory, it is possible to reach a semblance of our notions through art. We turn to painting and reincorporated your words to invent a new language that surpassed language, full of color and emotion, individual and collective loss and remembrance. We try to understand, and we also recognize our limitations to understanding. This fine balance we try to walk and make meaningful. Your words have done both, as well as pleasure, warmth, disgust, hatred, disbelief, uncertainty, anguish, faith. <coughs> we try to find a way to take responsibility for passing along your words as witness. We can take responsibility for ourselves. That is the easy part. We created a tangible memorial to try to encourage others to take responsibility for passing along the message. That we know what happened. That what happened is both overflowing with meaning and desperately lacking it. with ourselves and take in the power of, of what we've just experienced with a moment of silence.
Jerry Harsey has always said he wants kids to understand that they haven't really finished reading a book until they have had a discussion over the book. This project raises the ante when it comes to books like Night, so that you haven't really finished reading the book until you've been socially responsible in altering others and together keeping the vigil. It's about what Wiesel has said in the past, about always thinking higher and feeling deeper. So there are added layers then to bearing witness beyond remembering and giving testimony. There's also learning from history and acting against oppressive forces, social responsibility. If we trust and believe in Wiesel when he says, we are each other's hope, then we need to find ways of creating spaces that are democratizing to make available opportunities for all to participate. In this spirit, we would now like to create a participatory space for the next generation of witnesses to come forward. So that we ask that you find the card that someone handed you. There are three on the floor here. suggested that he would love to have these cards after this session is over. They can be anonymous, of course, but if you could share with him whatever you write on the cards so he won't be able to hear all of them, he would be very appreciative. So on one side of the card, we are asking you to, to jot words that come to mind that speak to your immediate response to this work. From this presentation or your response to it, words that may have been uttered here by the presenters or words that came to you or you noted down. It's a part of what they have called pulling apart what we feel. So please do that now.
On the other side of the card, we would ask that you write wonderings. You have been asked to ask new questions of the stories we encounter, as that was expressed by the people in this performance. Wonderings and brief questions. You can just say, I wonder. You can write something that you wondered about on the, on the other side. What we are asking ourselves to do here is to insert ourselves into this space as respondents, as participants, um, in the words of today, piecing together to represent complexity in some somewhat random way. We ask first that you turn to your words, the words you wrote initially. We would just like people to call out any word or words or phrase that this experience has evoked for you. And I will just recognize you by nodding at you or something so we don't all say one word and then it's over. Mm -hmm. So let's hear. Transformative. Transformative. Shame. Disruption. Power. Life and beauty over harm. Over genocide. Faith. Bearing witness. Ongoing. Collaborates and taking. Evil lives on. Hope. Thank you. Never forget, never again. Moral action. How power and beauty strangle teachers. Opportunities for education. Sacred. Solitary. Solitary. Cultural object. Cultural object. Finally. 
compassion. Recall. History of motion as well as in Incapable of standardization. <laughs> 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 We now invite you to call out your wonderings. Is a wounded face enough? I wonder how many of our performers today understand the sorrow as extending beyond the color. Will we ever be able to make heard the moans and screams of those who have no one to write of their suffering? I wonder what will happen to these works of art that honor and deface the life of us. How do you remember when all you've told us to forget? How can change be measured? What we cannot see, we think we need not know. I wondered about the division of labor and uh, how the division of labor was made. What you read out loud were those your actual writings, and how was that all organized together in this final piece? <laughs> I wonder how this um, experience of sitting with your reaction or sitting with your feelings um, might change the students who participated in the future, how they address them. Well, I wonder how this text might, might be taught with another text focused on genocide or historical atrocity experienced by another racial, ethnic, or other minority group. And what that might yield in terms of collaborative and comparative interpretation or meaning making. Is the art writing process possible just like it was done here in the time frame that you have? Could something like this ever be done? when cruelties are wrought today in the name of the religious faith. Mm. When art is seen as a tool to set up new questions in a way, way, the full way, the way I suggested, what new questions arise from the artworks created in response to that? Um, what do multimodal performances and experiences offer in terms of knowledge generation, transformation, collaboration, and action that traditional scholarship doesn't. I wonder how well we know the memories of people of color affected by colonialism and imperialism in the other world. I wondered about the meaning of um, dissecting works of art that we have considered sacred in order to make new art, and I wondered if that's a way of um, demonstrating a faith in the life of the art. <coughs> I wonder how to teach this book to children who have undergone trauma and feel numb to empathy because of that trauma. <coughs> so, Vivian and I are turning to the people who gave this to us today, mm -hmm. asking if you would like to respond with your own words or wonderings in any way you want to think about the new witness.
can't get a volunteer. Um, thank you, thank you for that response. It, was, it really means a lot to me. Um, and there are so many, there's so many things that I want to respond to. And I know we have a short time. Uh, there, I think, I, I think I want to respond for a moment to this, to a couple of things. One is about process. Um, because that may have been a bit unclear, and we chose to perform this in part because we wanted all of our voices heard in some kind of way. And in the spirit of this idea of the arts and ethnography and pedagogies of possibility, we really wanted to be true to that spirit in some kind, in some kind of way, so it wouldn't be me as some university-based researcher coming and presenting participants in my study. We really have tried at every point along the way to make this a collaborative project. Um, invited the participation of, of youth and teachers across a professional lifespan. Um, so I, I, as I think is mentioned in, in here, I may have mentioned my talk. You know, I had I was brought up as an artist. I mean, I, I was an art major at university, and I worked with Tim Rollins quite briefly in youth arts in my teaching quite a bit. And I'm fortunate to teach at University of Toronto, where we're given a huge amount of autonomy, both in the university but also in the schools. Um, to do things differently. So in the section of my pre-service literacy class where I would be teaching about curriculum, instead of teaching how to write seven-part lesson plans or how to do a novel study, um, I've, I've taken to inviting people to read books together. And not just together in a class, but together with others. So we've invited adolescents to come in and read with us. And this has involved a lot of different kinds of texts. Um, we, we chose Knight for this project. Most recently, our project is using um, Absolutely True Diary, the part-time Indian. And we worked with uh, 28 middle school kids who worked with us over three weeks. And um, they created curriculum. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, uh, curriculum theorists who talk about uh, students and teachers as authors of educational experience. But it's in the abstract. There's very little empirical research of children actually creating curriculum and what that might look like. Or even student teachers, for that matter, who are usually the recipients of the so-called experts' ideas about what they should be doing in classrooms. So this involved kids actually writing up lesson plans and then and working with teachers to do this and lots of different kinds of activities and how they might be assessed. And then they went away and they produced these artworks and brought them and shared them with uh, the teachers. And because we're in Toronto, um, this was considered a part of their work in their school. It's an alternative middle school. And we're now in the process of writing up these curriculum, and they're going to be a part of the curriculum in that school in eighth grade next year. So we do use other texts. And I think the questions that you're asking about why this text are good ones, um, you know, I feel a sort of imperative as a, as a grandchild of Holocaust survivors um, to do that. But um, in terms of the process, this involved lots of different locations, a youth group, um, Anna works with in West Toronto. Many of them are here today, but there are many that couldn't make the trip. We had two vans with 15 people that uh, came down here to do this. And, and in fact, um, one, of, one of us had planned up until the very last minute to be here, um, Amir Kalan, and Will kindly read his letter to Elie Wiesel. Um, apparently, the US State Department is not inviting Persian poets um, in these days. So though I wrote letters on his behalf and, and we worked to try and get him here, he couldn't be here today. But the process involved um, inviting everyone to sort of work on their individual book pages, some of which was kind of frustrating to me because having worked with Tim Rollins, I knew we were trying to get to a single color. And um, everyone kept doing these, what I now view as extraordinary resistances <laughs> to what I thought we should be doing. Um, and I would say, you know, okay, that, that looks really nice, but you do the color, because I know we have to get to this. So, and, and eventually I just gave up. And so we just had all of these triangles, and you've seen some of them here, and there are hundreds more that you haven't seen. Um, but the process, in part, for me as a teacher, is a kind of um, what Audrey and Rich would call inventing what you desire, or using what you have to invent what you desire. Um, and to do that collaboratively with these people has really meant an enormous amount to me. So I know that that may not have concretely answered your questions about the process, but it really was sort of equally working together to figure out um, how to do this work. And I learned a lot from Tim, but I didn't learn important things like how do you get the pages on the canvas. Um, and I did do a project on my own, a, a civil rights project, doing, doing sort of similar process that was uh, in the um, mayor's office in San Francisco for a number of years in semi permanent display. So I had done it before, but I also forgot so this was a chance to kind of figure that out with these guys. So are there other, anyone else would like to respond? Yeah. 
He sent me to the mic. You should know better. <laughs> I think we have we have a few more minutes. I'd love to hear from you guys if there's anything that you want to respond to. Well, um, I'll quickly respond to and just say that I mean I think Jason expressed it well. Like as graduate students, we we don't often have the opportunity to um, engage in these types of uh, community-based multimodal art space projects. And just to give a quick anecdote of what that entails, um, I had to go down and get some affixative spray for the charcoal after we had um, done the Kaddish. And when I came back, um, Ashley and uh, Emily were like making this beautiful piece. Uh, I didn't even know if it was possible because we had ashes and water at first. So we sprayed it with the affixative and um, the whole hallways of Boise smelled, like really potently. And so when I came in the next day, the um, professors were saying, what's that smell? And I was like, what is that? And so, I mean, the campus was already uh, getting people to ask questions, so it was pretty, <laughs> pretty effective that way. Um, so as Rob said, um, so I'm a teacher in Toronto, and uh, these are, I just wanted, first of all, to introduce the youth individually because they made a huge trip yeah. here. I took some time off school. So this is Antonino, as you heard. And so and Kevin and Julia as well. There was a question that came up about using different texts um, from other genocides and the other the term other genocides has come up and all sorts of dehumanization that's happened we're experiencing all over the world today so just a little caveat that ties into that um, and we are really lucky sometimes to be at OISE and to be in Toronto um, in Ontario at individual schools there's a lot of leeway with what you can do so I didn't mention in my vignette um, because I wrote it so long ago but we Rob and I just applied for ethics to take this project into the school. So along with 120 students reading night, they just finished painting triangles as well in my classes. So um, it's just the amazing work that can be done and it's inspired so many of us teachers, the teachers who are here today. Just having these kids here, these young adults, having that courage, and Emmanuel, you mentioned courage, and it's sort of, I know we talked a little bit about that as a word, the courage to come up here, but then the courage to try to do it in schools. and the. I never thought I would be able to do it in a school, so it's amazing that we're, we're able to do that and just trying to navigate those boundaries to get that into schools. So I didn't mention that, but something to add on. Um, so last semester, from September to December, we read a novel called July's People in my class. And um, when you think about how to bring other kinds of texts in for this kind of a project, um, in the curriculum in Ontario, every student learns about World War II in grade 10. And so I was doing it with grade 11s. I didn't bring in night because I wanted to try something new. July's people is about apartheid in South Africa. And they had no background for it. So there was a level of uh, difficulty for them to actually get into it. Um, Civil rights is not as ingrained into Canadian students as it is in the U.S. So even bringing that in, I brought in some MLK, you know, I was like, you guys know him, but it was still more difficult. So um, making sure that they're familiar with the experience beforehand, I think, um, helped, helped with night a little bit, whereas with July's people, it was it was a struggle and they didn't actually have the same natural reaction to um, what was portrayed in July's people. So I just thought I'd offer that.